Thank you. Uh, it's very nice to be here. And uh, I'd like to thank Junyun for inviting me. But Junyun and I had the same supervisor as thesis, uh, though, though he was a few years uh, after me. So, and the person who invented these objects called higher Chow cycles. Okay. So, uh, the topic I'm going to talk about today is, uh, as you can see, higher Chow cycles and modular forms. It's sort of a link between two objects uh, which, uh, I mean, you don't normally expect and, uh, um, well, anyway, I will describe how exactly the link comes about. Okay, if I can press this. Oh, nothing happened. Am I pressing the wrong way? Ah, okay. Sorry. So, okay. So, uh, uh, the objects we initially consider are called elliptic curves, which are at least over complex numbers, are basically complex tori. So, it's a C mod lower lattice where, la where uh, lambda is isomorphic to Z, direct sum Z tau, and tau is in the upper half plane. These are objects which have <coughs> studied quite, uh, quite a lot by number theorists and uh, have uh, appeared in all kinds of places. Okay. But we'll, at the moment, just think of them as C modulo or lattice. So that means it's, uh, and geometrically, they're complex, they're tori, they're uh, uh, genus one objects. Okay. <clears throat> now the set of all elliptic curves up to isomorphism are parameterized by, sorry, without isomorphism, but the set of all elliptic curves parameterized by tau in the upper half plane. And isomorphism classes, uh, two lattices will give you the same elliptic curve if they differ by an element of SL2Z. So uh, the upper half plane model of SL2Z, which is isomorphic to the complex numbers, is the parameter space of all elliptic curves. And somehow in, in number theory, one considers uh, other subgroups of SL2Z, or what equivalently amounts to if you put more conditions on the isomorphisms, like they should take certain subgroups of one curve to the other, then the parameter space, which is called the model I space, uh, is, uh, is uh, we denote by Y gamma, where which is upper half plane model of gamma, where gamma is some subgroup of SL2Z. Okay? So there are these things which are usually called congruence subgroups, and uh, they parameterize elliptic curves with additional conditions. Okay? Not only up to isomorphism plus some additional information. Okay? So the Y gamma are one dimensional complex manifolds and have a natural compactification, which we denote by X gamma, okay? So their upper plane model of gamma is not a compact curve in general, but uh, you can compactify it in a very natural way. And the points X gamma minus Y gamma are called cusps. So coming back to the example when gamma is SL2Z, the upper half plane model of SL2Z is just the complex numbers, and you add one point and you get a copy of the projective space, P1, okay? And in fact, these curves are very special. These, well, they're complex curves or complex, uh, one dimensional complex manifolds. So somehow, uh, uh, algebraic geometers consider them as complex curves. And uh, 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 yeah, they're in fact the complex points of the algebraic curve defined over a number field. Quite often, it's the rational numbers itself. Okay. Uh, and sometimes you can consider what's called the elliptic surface, the universal elliptic surface, which is uh, every point on this curve corresponds to an elliptic curve. So you consider the, uh, the surface, such that the inverse image of the point tau is the curve it parameterizes. Okay, that's called the universal elliptic curve surface. So the fiber over a point is uh, pi inverse of tau is E tau. And one can consider the abelian surface uh, over Y tau, which is given by E tau, uh, E gamma cross y gamma over e gamma. That means at every point the fiber is e tau cross e tau. Okay? So this is now a threefold, a family of abelian surfaces, okay? and which has a canon canonical compactification, okay? which we will denote by w gamma. Okay? So w gamma is a threefold, three-dimensional algebraic variety defined over a number field. Okay? More generally, we sometimes want to consider uh, just family of abelian surfaces over a curve. Okay. Okay. So now these elliptic curves are also groups. And an endomorphism of the elliptic curve is a homomorphism from the elliptic curve to itself. For example, one 
simple way is by multiplication by an integer. Okay, you take a point p and you multiply it by n, right? Okay. Uh, the graph of an endomorphism determines the codimension one cycle on e cross e. If I take any map from e to e and I look at its graph, it's going to give you a, a, a one-dimensional subvariety of e cross e, and so it's a it's a codimension one cycle. Oh, I should say what a cycle is. Cycle is just a codimension one variety. Somehow, okay, I should maybe state this also. Somehow in algebraic geometry, you like to say things in terms of codimension rather than dimension because codimension behaves better with respect to certain maps. Okay, so somehow I, I might, it may seem strange that I say codimension one is saying dimension, but uh, okay. And uh, um, this group called the Neron Severi group, which is the image of codimension one cycles in H2 of E cross E Z. Okay, so there is a there is a map uh, from this uh, group of codimension one cycles on E cross E to uh, certain cohomology groups, and the image is called the Neron Severi group. Maybe in some one way of thinking about it. Okay. So in general, the only endomorphisms of an elliptic curve are given by multiplication by uh, an element of Z. Okay. So what that kind of implies in this context is that, in general, the rank of the neuron severi group, the rank of the neuron severi group is a is a is a free abelian group of a certain rank, and in this case, it's generated by uh, three elements: e cross zero, zero cross e, and the diagonal. These are three obvious things, right? So e cross zero is the graph of zero. Zero cross e is uh, well, zero. Come, it's not exactly a graph of anything, but maybe you can think of it as a graph or something. But and then the di the graph of the identity map is the diagonal. Okay, but under certain circumstances, there are some additional endomorphisms. So, if tau, you know, recall tau is an element of the upper half space. If it's also an imaginary quadratic number, that means it satisfies an equation of degree two over q, right? Then uh, multiplication by tau preserves lambda, lambda tau, because you'll take a plus b tau. Maybe I'll write down. Suppose you have an a plus b tau, and I multiply by tau. Uh, now tau satisfies some tau squared plus say m tau plus n is equal to zero, right? By assumption, then this thing will be written as a tau plus b tau squared. Uh, but then you can write tau squared as m tau plus n, so you finally get something in the lattice. So when something preserves the lattice, it induces an endomorphism of the elliptic curve, and uh, the graphs, uh, sorry, yeah. the graphs of this side endomorphism gives a fourth element in the neuron series of e tau cross e tau, and e tau is said to have complex multiplication. So these are certain uh, special distinguished points on the moduli of elliptic curves, on the parameter space of elliptic curves. Okay, and uh, usually one modifies the cycle to get a cycle which we will denote by z tau, okay, which is orthogonal to the generic neuron severi. So on this neuron severi group, it's a surface, so there's something called the intersection pairing, and uh, with respect to that, you can take, you can, uh, you have, uh, in general, you have e cross zero, zero cross e and the diagonal, and now you have this fourth guy, you can sort of or, orthogonalize it so that it's orthogonal to the other three, and you call that cycle the CM cycle. Okay? So, it's a cycle in the fiber e tau cross e tau over a CM point, but that's lying inside a threefold. <coughs> so, as a cycle on the whole three dimensional object, it's a codimension two cycle. Okay? And the point tau, or uh, the point z tau, so we, I mean, it's a point tau, but being considered as a point on x, so you're dividing out by the action of the group, uh, is called a CM point. Okay? And in fact, the converse is true. If the rank of the neuron severi is 4, then the curve necessarily has CM. Okay, this is the theorem of Shioda from about uh, 40 years ago. Okay? Right? Uh, so somehow uh, the rank of the neuron severi affects the thing. Okay. Now the next objects we will consider are modular forms. So this is a rather rapid fire introduction to modular forms, which is not very precise either. But anyway. 
So a function from the upper half plane to the complex number is said to be a modular form of weight k or gamma if uh, it satisfies this equivariance property. If uh, g of gamma tau is c tau plus d raised to k times g tau for all gamma and gamma. Okay. So for example, if I had a function which is gamma invariant, it would be a modular form of weight 0. Okay. And gamma acts on the upper half plane by what are usually called linear fractional transformations. Gamma tau is a tau plus b over c tau plus d. Okay. And then usually one adds holomorphicity conditions and some growth conditions to get a precise definition of modular forms. Okay. Okay. So the space of holomorphic modular forms is usually denoted by mk gamma, modular forms of weight k for gamma. And uh, well, about uh, I mean you can also allow gamma to be sorry k to be in a half integer, okay, and also define the space of modular forms of half integer weight, okay. But then half integer means you're taking c tau plus d raised to k, where k is a half integer, so you'll be more careful because you're taking square roots, and you'll worry about plus or minus and so on and so forth, okay. But let's uh, brush all those things away. <laughs> that let it be okay. So and most of the time, if you look at it, if the if the element one zero, so one one zero one is in gamma, that means that what it translates to is the function is periodic, and so then it'll have a Fourier expansion. And if it's holomorphic, it'll have a Fourier expansion of the form g tau with summation a n q to the n, where q is e to the two pi i tau. Okay, this is a uh, right. So if you have a holomorphic function and you write the Fourier expansion, it has, which is periodic, it will have a Fourier expansion. So, uh, <coughs> yeah. So this is this is what a modular form is in some rather uh, simple sense. Sorry, am I doing the right thing? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So now there's a famous uh, theorem of gross zagier which dates back to the early, uh, maybe mid '80s. Uh, says the following. Okay. You fix a discriminant, which, uh, just a number less than d, uh, which is less than zero, and you count. You consider all points tau of discriminant d by e squared. So d. Uh, so for a quadratic form, for a quadratic equation, the discriminant is a x squared plus b x plus c equal to zero. The discriminant is b squared minus four ac. So let's call that d. Uh, <coughs> if d is a uh, um, uh, and usually you take those discriminants d which are less than zero. Okay, you take all the points tau whose discriminant is minus d over e squared, where e squared divides d. So you take not only d but d by all its. Uh, so I think these are called. Uh, if it's if uh, e squared doesn't divide d, d is called primitive, but you allow imprimitive discriminants, right? Okay. Now there are finally many such points on 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 the on that curve x. Right, <coughs> and uh, by taking the divisor z tau minus infinity, so so on the let's for simplicity stick with the upper plane modulo SL two z, which is a copy of the complex numbers, and I'm taking its compact fiction, which is the projective space, projective line. Uh, you have one point at infinity, so you will denote that by infinity, and. Uh, uh, that determines the divisor of degree zero, this adding up all these points. So we call that divisor Z D, okay, and it lies. It's a divisor of degree zero on the curve uh, on the Jacobian of X. Uh, well, on the curve X gamma. So therefore, it gives you an element, a point in the Jacobian of X gamma, okay. And Gross and Zagier proved the following uh, remarkable theorem about these divisors. They said uh, the function g tau, which is summation z d q to the d over d, is a model of our weight 3 over 2 with coefficients in j of x gamma. Okay. So what does it mean to be a model of our weight 3 over 2? I mean, it means it satisfies that nice uh, equivariance property with respect to gamma. Okay. And its coefficients lie in, uh, well, the z, oops, sorry. Uh, the ZDs are actually in J gamma, so the coefficient makes sense there. But what does it mean in, in sort of ordinary sense? We have decide, defined modular forms only for um, periodic functions. So what this means is that if you have any linear function on J of X gamma, okay, the series summation 
lambda z d q to the d is an honest to goodness modular form in the sense of uh, what I defined above. Okay, and an example of lambda is what's called the height pairing. Okay, you pair z d minus z tau, uh, z d and z z zero for some fixed point z zero, and that gives you a number, and that sum of numbers uh, gives you the coefficients of a modular form over three over two. Okay, so it's a remarkable theorem in the sense that it's kind of a bit strange that from these points on a curve you're getting some sort of interesting function. Oops. And in general there's a conjecture of Kudla. Yeah. Yeah. No, not necessarily. Yeah, it's a complex number. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. I should also be slightly, I'm being a bit imprecise here in many of the statements I'm making on modular forms. One has to take vector valued modular forms and so on and so forth to get the right statements. But I don't want to get into all that because it will be just too much and so I wanted to give an idea of it. Okay. So, uh, um, yeah, there's a conjecture of Kudla which says more or less something similar that in summation Z D Q to the D, this is a modular form of a certain type of, for a certain group where Z D are certain special sub varieties or what are called Shimura varieties. So one, the notion of modular curve generalizes to some higher dimensional objects called Shimura varieties and uh, on that you, you have uh, like the special points we described Z D, there are certain special sub varieties and you can take uh, um, these sort of linear combinations of those things and again you expect those things to be modular forms of a certain type, okay, in a sort of precise sense, I mean I could la has made it precise. But this conjecture was sort of a theorem in uh, many cases, in fact before Gross and Zagier. So there's a theorem of Herzebuch Zagier which goes back to the 70s which says that if you take a uh, certain, so instead of taking uh, the upper half plane, you take the upper half plane cross the upper half plane and you act by uh, uh, SL2, instead of SL2 Z, you act by SL2 OK where K is the real quadratic field, you get certain uh, surfaces are called Hilbert modular surfaces. On, they parameterize abelian surfaces with certain uh, real multiplication. Okay. On that Hilbert modular surface you have certain special curves and uh, those curves are called modular curves and uh, analogous to the, so there are the an analogs of uh, the gross Zagier special points and again uh, <coughs> Herzberg and Zagier had proved that summation Z d q to d was a modular form of weight uh, 2, okay. Earlier it was 3 and a half, 3 over 2, now it is 2 and there is a theorem of Fanda here which says that analogously you have a Ziegel model of 3 fold and you have these special surfaces on it uh, and once again you get a modular form of weight 5 over 2, okay. So there is, and then in fact there was a work of Hermann which look, looked at certain moduli of K3 surfaces and which was a 4 fold and on that you have certain special three folds and these things. But they were always looking at divisors on uh, a certain n dimensional variety. Yeah. No, these are all orthogonal Shimura varieties. Uh, so all these are orthogonal. Yeah. So yeah, I, in fact, I was just about to say that in the next slide, I think. So all the moduli above are examples of what are called orthogonal Shimura varieties. Hermitian symmetric space of OT where T is a transcendental lattice in H2A uh, of an abelian surface. So this is of type 2N or N2 sometimes. For instance, oh, oops. For instance, if A is uh, E cross E, our example, our, our uh, neuron semi lattice of rank 3 and H2 is of rank 6 for any abelian surface. So T is of rank 3, it's a 2, 1 lattice and the corresponding Hermitian symmetric space is a, is a modular curve X. Uh, the special sub variety or similar sub variety is determined by embedding smaller transcendental lattice or equally larger neuron severity groups. So as we said, you know, in the CM point situation, you have one more element in the neuron severity group. So therefore the transcendental lattice becomes smaller, right? So in the example, 
if lambda is in t with lambda squared is uh, minus d less than 0, then if you take td, which is the orthogonal complement of lambda, this is of type uh, uh, 2, 0. And if you take the corresponding Hermitian space corresponding to that, it's a, it's a Hermitian symmetric space of type 2, 0, which is just a bunch of points. Okay? And it's those points where the transcendental lattice is td, or equivalently, the neuron severity has lambda inside in it, it. So lambda is of rank, so the neuron series of rank four. Okay, so <coughs> it's a sum of, sum of certain points and turns out to be essentially this Z D, the point uh, we described earlier, the special C M point or Higner point. Okay. Okay, so. That was over 20, maybe a little over 20 years ago. Borchertz proved all these theorems in one shot with the following idea. Okay, uh, so the idea is the following: Suppose you have a power series, or rather, yeah, I mean, where Q is usually e to the 2 pi i n z. So you're thinking of it as a Fourier expansion or something. Okay, when is it the Fourier expansion of a modular form? Okay, so given a, so the idea is that sort of. You can write down a relation. A relation is just a collection of integers, uh, lambda n, okay, which are finally many non-zero integers such that if summation an q to the n is a modular form of weight k for gamma, if and only if summation an lambda n is equal to zero for all relations lambda n. Okay? So these modular forms have a special property that you can write down these kind of relations for it. Okay? Okay. So it, this says that if so, if you have a bunch of relations and uh, you have a power series, if the coefficient of power series satisfy this property, then uh, then that power series is the Fourier expansion of a modular form. Okay. So, but what Borchers observed was that the space of relations itself can be identified with the space of what are called weakly holomorphic modular forms, or weight two minus k. So. A weakly holomorphic modular form is a modular form which has poles at the cusps. So earlier I said there was some holomorphism condition, and that need not be always mandated. So you define this thing called a weakly holomorphic modular form, which you allow yourself to have poles at the cusps. And he observed that, oops, sorry, lambda is a relation for uh, uh, for the modular form of weight k, if and only if there's a weakly holomorphic modular form G. Of weight two minus k, where the principal part of the uh, is is summation lambda n by q to the n. Okay, that means the negative part of the uh, fourier laura expansion of the weakly holomorphic modular form is coming from this lambda n's. Okay, and there are only finitely many lambda n's are non-zero, so this is a this is a pole. Okay, so Borchardt's idea was if you want to show that summation z d q to the d is a modular form. An approach would be to show that there's a correspondence between space of relations for modular form weight three over two, and space of relations between CM points. Okay, so that's the crucial idea. It's somehow you you have some condition under which you get modular forms. Well, then the same condition might imply the, these things. Okay. Now these ZDs are divisors on the modular curve. So the space of relations is the space of functions on X with divisor support of these special points. So your relations between points are just divisors of functions, right? In the in, in the Jacobian, something is zero in the Jacobian if it's the divisor of a function. So the space of relations between points are the divisor of functions. Okay. Uh, so in our in our case, we want three k equal to three over two. So we should have a map or a correspondence between weakly holomorphic model on weight 3 over 2 and functions on X with divisible, divisorial support on the CM points. Okay. And that's what Borchers did. Well, but his, uh, he had this famous theorem, uh, uh, lifting theorem. So starting with a weakly holomorphic model on weight 3 over 2 with principal part uh, summation. Uh, b minus d by q to d, he defined a theta lift which he, we call phi f tau, which is an automorphic form on the modular curve, okay. And its divisor is supported precisely on those submoduli where there's an element lambda in the lattice of square d, 
and this induces the relation summation b minus e z d equal to zero. Okay, so that was enough. I mean, I'm saying this rather simplistically, but that by the discussion about this implies that the series summation z d q to d is a model of a weight three over two. Okay, that was sort of a really uh, wonderful idea in some ways because you are, uh, but the the hard thing was this this lifting which he defined. Okay, and of course the same argument will work with half replaced by zero and minus half. So if you replace by zero, you'll get model forms of weight two minus zero, which is weight two, and that implied the theorem of herzberg zagier And if you minus half, you get model forms of weight three uh, five over two, which implied the theorem of Fanda here. Okay, and also the theorem of Hermann, which came from uh, the next minus one and three, I guess. So every time, wherever, whenever there was a theorem regarding, wherever there was a theorem earlier about uh, s certain divisors on uh, on these orthogonal Shimura varieties giving you modular forms, uh, that theorem came out of consequence of Borchard's uh, generalization of the gross zagier theorem. Okay, so in all, all those theorems just came out like this in one shot. Um, and also, when Gross and Zagier had proved it, they had sort of done it in a different way and much more complicated. So this sort of simplified uh, uh, and generalized the original theorem of Gross and Zagier. For instance, it implied the theorem for Shimura curves in a fairly straightforward manner. And yeah, somehow it just uh, was a fantastic theorem. Okay. So, but in all these cases, we've been looking at divisors on, on higher dimensional model. I and mean, first we have curves, then you have curves on surfaces, surfaces on three folds, three folds on four folds, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but you can also set, consider certain higher co-dimensional cycles over the Shimura curves, on Kuga, what are called Kuga Sato varieties, over the Shimura curves, okay? So recall, we had these CM cycles Z tau, which are co-dimension two cycles on W tau. W tau was a threefold, and we had this uh, E cross E. We had a point tau here on the base, and in the fiber you have sort of E, maybe E cross E, and inside that you have this special Z tau here, and we are thinking of this as a cycle on the whole object, so it's of co-dimension two. Okay, we call them the CM cycles, right? Which I, oh, one can add up the cycles of discriminant minus d squared by e to form a cycle z d as before, and the, the cycles z d are homologous to zero as it turns out, so you don't have to subtract infinity. Okay, they are also interesting from other points of view that they're uh, somehow in uh, algebraic cycle people cycles people are interested in finding cycles which are homologous to zero but not always algebraically equal to zero, and they give you examples of that. In fact, that's how they were first considered. Okay. So analogous to the theorem of Gross and Zagier, one has this time conjecturally that summation z d q to the d is a model home weight five over two. Okay. And in fact, you can generalize this picture. Well, oh, I forgot to put a full stop there. But more generally, there are certain cycles of co-dimension k on uh, this e gamma to two k minus two, analogous to CM cycles. And they should be related to model on weight 2k plus 1 over 2. Okay, exactly analogous. So if k is uh, 0, I guess you should get 2k minus 2 is 0, and 2k plus 1 over 2 is, sorry, k is 1, you get 0 here, ah, and then this will be 3 over 2, and that's the Gross Zagier theorem. Okay, and uh, the CM cycles are when k is equal to 2, so you have e cross e tau cross e tau, and uh, uh, you would expect five over two here. Okay, so adopting a similar argument, one should expect a correspondence between the space of relations for model forms of weight two k plus one over two, and the space of relations between CM cycles of co-dimension k. Right, as we had earlier, the relation between divisors, uh, well, the space of relations between model forms of weight three over two and the space of relation between points, right? And of course, the space of relations, this is a purely uh, formal thing that the left-hand side, 
will just be the space of weakly holomorphic uh, modular forms of weight 3 minus 2k over 2. Right? Uh, so, in the case of uh, uh, k equal to 2, which is the one of interest, it will be minus half. Okay? But the right side is a little more uh, unclear. The space of relation in CM cycles of co dimension k. So, earlier it was functions with divisors on the CM points. Now it has to be something analogous to that. Right? So, that is where these higher Chow groups come in. Okay? So, in the Chow group of cycles on a variety x, relation means co dimension 1 cycles are given by functions. Okay? Similarly, relations mean co dimension k, k cycles are given by considering divisor of functions on co dimensional k minus 1 sub varieties. Okay? So, uh, what you are doing is you, so to define the Chow group more or less, you take the, um, uh, you say uh, something is uh, rational equal to 0 if it is the divisor of a of a function on a on a bunch of co-dimension k minus one uh, uh, sub varieties. Okay. Uh, so these objects can be formalized as elements of the higher Chow group, Chow k x one. Okay. Uh, so in our case, uh, there is something called the localization sequence for higher Chow groups, which links all these objects. Okay, so let eta denote the generic point on the modular curve, and e eta the generic fiber. Okay, and let w k gamma denote the canonical compactation of e to k minus two gamma. In as much as so, if k is uh, one, w k gamma is just the curve x gamma. When k is two, it is that what we call w gamma. In general, you have a canonical compactation of e to the two k minus two. Eta. <coughs> so one has a long exact sequence which links all these three objects. Uh, these objects. Well, it continues, but yeah. So it's not three objects, but so you have a map from Chow k e to k minus two eta one to Chow k minus one e x the, at the fiber over x of two k minus two. So this is where the CM cycles live. Okay. And this is the Chow group of co-dimension k cycles on Wk. Okay, so in other words, what one is saying is, so in the case when k is equal to one, this is uh, k minus one zero on points. So this is but just a bunch of points. Okay, and you're taking this group is just functions. So functions taking its divisor. This is the free group on points, and this is the uh, group of functions. So the quotient is the uh, <coughs> Jacobian. Yeah, okay, I mean, maybe it's a little more precise on this thing, but it's okay. Okay, so with all this philosophy, you expect a correspondence between weakly holomorphic model of weight 3 over 2, 3 minus 2k over 2, and elements of this group, because this group here plays the role of functions with divisors on these special points. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. So, in the case of k equal to 1, the higher Chow cycles is functions with special divisors. In general, it is not clear how you can find these objects. In fact, in general, it is pretty hard to find explicit higher Chow cycles. Okay. Finding relations between higher co dimensional cycles is, is quite a difficult task in general. Okay. But if you look at the work of Borchers, he does not quite construct the function f, whose divisor is the thing. He constructs the function log f. Okay. And log of absolute value of x, f. Okay? And somehow between f and log f, there isn't much difference. But uh, it's what log f is, is the real regulator of f. Okay? And so this suggests an approach. Uh, so Bloch and uh, Balenson, when creating the theory, well, Bloch initially created the theory of higher Chow groups and Balenson sort of generalized that, um, they defined uh, what are called regulator maps. From higher Chow groups to certain generalized tori, okay, called Delian cohomology groups, but we generalize the classical Dirichlet regular map, which is log f, okay, as well as the Abel Jacobi map, the usual classical Abel Jacobi map, uh, yeah, and they also define what you would call the real regulator, which takes values in the real vector space over R. So, yeah, I, I would say the Dirichlet regulator should be log of f, 
and log of absolute value f is sort of the real version of that. So, uh, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. So this regular object is a current on certain k minus one, k minus one forms. In our case, we have a family of varieties over a base x. Okay. A higher Chow cycle in in the generic fiber will restrict to give a higher Chow cycle in most fibers, right? Okay. So that's what a higher Chow cycle looks like. Okay. And if you have a family W tau is a so in our case we have a base x with the parameter tau on it, okay, and uh, we have a higher Chow cycle in generic fiber which we are thinking of as something again you can think of as parameterized by tau. It's a family of cycles parameterized by tau at most places, okay, uh, and uh, if you also have a family of one one forms, okay, uh, or k minus one k minus one forms in general you can evaluate this regulator on it to get a function of the base as a function of tau which will have singularity at those points where the cycle is not defined okay so let's come to the example of our log so for example if you have a cycle in chow 1 eta 1 which is a function f right if you look at the function f of tau uh, f of tau will be in c star at most uh, for most tau except when it has a divisor f of tau is not going to be c star when it's either 0 or infinity, right? Okay. And um, the real regulator is uh, log of, uh, the regulator is log of f tau and the resulting function is, the function we are thinking of is sort of the analog of log of f, right? Okay. So, and similarly the real regulator as a function on this family w tau, in this case there's no 0, 0 form, so there's nothing really, okay? But the real regulator is uh, is log of absolute value of f tau uh, of f, okay. And this will have singularities precisely where f is no longer in C star. In other words, the divisor of f. Okay. Otherwise, it's defined perfectly fine, right? I mean, it's, it, it, for most points tau, f of tau will lie in chow one, tau one, tau is a so somehow one might guess that the analog is to look at the regu real regulator of these higher Chow cycles and relate that to the Borchers lifts of modular forms. Okay. So now the usual Borchers lift will not work. The one which he used to prove his theorem, generalizing the gross Zagia theorem. Okay. Because uh, the the orthogonal Shimura variety or the, the lattice that comes up depends on what you the weight of the form you put in okay so if you put in a weight minus half form you'll get a function on on o two three but we want something on o two one right okay because we want something in the universal family over the base over the modular curve and not o two three will be sort of the Ziegel modular threefold okay but Borchers had defined more general lifts uh, than just taking an f, uh, he had defined a lift which, uh, which we'll denote by phi f p tau, where p is a certain polynomial. So again, I'm skipping over a huge theory here, but he had defined certain uh, theta functions and this is sort of a, what they call a theta lift, and uh, which were dependent on this p and, uh, uh, yeah, well the theta function were dependent on p, and when you uh, uh, apply the theta lift to that, you get a, certain automatic form, a certain group, okay. And what uh, Zemel observed that for certain polynomials pk, of the Borchers lift phi pk is an automatic form on, on O21, but of different way and different kinds of singularities, okay. <coughs> In fact, he was able to prove a version of the theorem of Gross and Zagier where the relations he defined, so, he, you know, you want to show there's a connection between modular forms of a certain weight and relations between uh, certain cycles, okay. But what he did was he said, okay, you take a uh, model of a certain weight and you apply these things, and uh, these lifts, he defined those things as the relations between the, with the, between the CM points in some ways. And uh, um, he could prove a version of the Gross Zagier theorem using that, okay. So, 
to distinguish this from the Bocher's lift, we will call this the Bocher Zemel lift. So I'm not sure if we use it really. Okay. So considering all this stuff, you can make the following conjecture. Okay. Given a weakly holomorphic form f of weight 3 minus 2k, there exists a higher Chow cycle uh, psi f in Chow k uh, e, uh, e, e eta 2k minus 2 1 such that the regulator of this thing evaluated on certain 1 1 form is equal to this Borchardt's lift, Borchardt's Zemin lift. Okay. So this is the link. So the this case of uh, k equal to 1 is the work of Borchardt's on gross Zagier. He shows that the log of some function is equal to this Borchardt's lift. Okay. And of course, there is no reason to stick to this, uh, the base being a modular curve. You can have the base being any orthogonal Shimura variety if you want. I mean, you can make the conjecture. <laughs> right. Okay. So, right. So, you expect this kind of thing. Oops. Sorry. Okay. Right. Okay. So, our main thing is to prove this conjecture when k is equal to 2. Okay. So, given a model of weight minus half f, we will construct a higher Chow cycle psi f in the group Chow 2 e eta 2 1 such that the regulatory value in a certain family of 1 1 forms is the Borchardt semilift lift of uh, lift phi uh, f p2 tau. That is the what we will talk about in the remaining 15 minutes, right? Yeah. Oh, yes. Okay. <sighs> okay. So, the first thing is to understand what these functions uh, you get out of this, uh, you know, you have these two types of functions. I mean, you are sort of trying to say an equality of two types of functions. You have one function here, you have another function here. So, what do they look like? Right? Okay. First, the left hand side, the function is regulator xi w tau. Right? So, about 10, 12 years ago, in his thesis, Anton Mellet related them what are called higher Green's functions. Okay? So, the higher Green's functions uh, of weight k for x equal to x gamma is defined by this uh, formula. Uh, um, gx is the sum of uh, certain Legendre functions evaluated. Uh, evaluated, the, I mean, I mean, it's it's a, it's a formula. So <laughs> there's not much to be said about that, right? It's a definition, but the motivation was uh, when k is equal to zero, it's more or less like log. Even though this is sorry, when k is equal to one, it's more or less a log. Okay, it's related to the log. Log of tau one minus tau two, more or less. Okay. Um, plus some other things because it's this is not defined for k equal to 1 okay right okay so it's a unique function satisfying the following properties it's smooth outside the diagonal so it's a uh, if you take the diagonal which is in h cross h uh, modulo uh, uh, oops, modulo is in the wrong direction but tau comma gamma tau okay and it's gamma invariant okay and it should be the eigen function for the Laplacian with eigenvalue k into 1 minus k. And it has logarithmic, logarithmic singularities of the form, uh, this is m is more or less 1 most of the time, but log tau 1 minus tau 2. Okay. So, and it vanishes at the cusps. As, as tau 1 or tau 2 tends to a cusp, uh, uh, it vanishes. Also, it's symmetric. I guess I forgot to mention it's symmetric. Okay. So this is a this characterizes this property. So if you have a function which satisfies all these properties, it has to be a higher Green's function. Okay, that's the crucial thing. Okay. So using uniqueness, Menet showed that for a particular choice of a k minus one k minus one form W tau, for a certain higher Chow cycle, for a higher Chow cycle. Uh, um, Xi in this, this group, uh, yeah, in fact, this is in general. The regulator of this is a sum of uh, certain of these higher Green's functions, where uh, one of the, uh, you, you, it's a function of two variables. So, one variable is summation eight, ai gk tau i, comma tau. Okay? So, where the tau i's are determined by the boundary map or the boundary of this element. Okay, so this xi i is a relation between certain CM cycles, okay, and so it will determine certain points tau i in its divisor more or less, 
and you put those things in here and he showed that the regulator is equal to this, this function. Okay, So what it means is the regulator uh, of a higher Chow cycle can be expressed in terms of higher Green's function. Oops, sorry. Which singularity is determined by the boundary of the cycle in the localization sequence. So where the divisor of the function is. Okay. On the other hand, from the work of Zemmel, one can see that the botched Zemmel lift is also a linear combination with higher Green's functions. Okay. So to prove our conjecture, given a weakly holomorphic model of form, one has to construct a higher Chow cycle such that the regulator regularities has a, sorry such that the regulator has the same singularities as the Borchardt Zemmel lift. We're claiming the equality of two different functions. Both of them turn out to give you higher Green's functions. If we knew that the singularities were the same, then the uniqueness of this higher Green's functions, which are determined by their singularities, would imply that they're the same. So therefore, we have to construct a higher Chow cycle which has singularities in exactly the same place as, as the, um, the Borchardt Zemmel lift has singularities. Okay, I mean that's a bit of an artificial way of going around. You should be directly going from the model of forms directly to the higher Chow group, but sort of you have to go to this in intermediate stage of these higher Green's functions. Okay. Um, right. Okay. And there's another consequence of this stuff, which is Gross and Zagier and Gross Kohn and Zagier made precise conjectures about the algebraicity of values of the higher Green's functions. They define certain sums of Green's functions G lambda determined by relation lambda between model of form, uh, determined by relation lambda between model of forms, and conjecture that the value of that Green's function G lambda. Um, um, is the log of an algebraic number when evaluated at a certain CM point distinct from the points determined by lambda. So lambda will determine a certain set of points and you sort of take a sum like uh, this where you one, one, the z tau's will be, z, zd's will be determined by lambda and you evaluate at a point tau where tau is another CM point which is not one of those zd's and you expect that to be the log of an algebraic number. Okay. Okay. On the other hand, um, if you have this connection between higher Green's functions and uh, higher Chow groups, which is what, uh, and, and the relation, right? So what Mellet can show is that if you have a higher Chow cycle and you take the regulator, then you get certain higher Green's functions and you evaluate that higher Green's function at a CM point, that number has to be a uh, log of an algebraic number. Okay. So Gross and Zagier conjecture something about relations between modular forms giving you algebraicity, log algebraicity, and Mellet shows the other way around. If you have a higher Chow cycle, then you get log algebraicity. So again, it sort of provides more evidence for the link. Okay. Um, so if tau is a CM point, then the form uh, W tau or omega tau on which the current is valid is actually represented by the CM cycle Z tau. So the, <coughs> so the value, uh, the regulator, so we are also assuming that Xi restricted to tau is actually a higher Chow cycle there. So uh, it's, it turns out to be the, the pairing of this regulator Xi tau evaluated uh, paired with W tau is the same as the regulator of the intersection of these two cycles. Okay where this is the intersection product of higher Chow cycles. So you have a intersection product which goes like this from um, Chow k e tau 2k minus 2 1 tensor Chow k minus 1 e 2k minus 2 to, to this group. Uh, now what this group is, say for example the case when k is equal to 2, this group is Chow 3 e 2 1. Ah, I think this, this should be 2k minus 2 anyway. Yeah, sorry. Uh, it's a, it's the group Chow 3 e 2 1 which translates to certain points uh, on, on this uh, uh, surface and uh, actually certain functions evaluate certain points on this function. Okay? So in general the group, this group can be identified with k star and then the regulator is just the logarithm of the absolute value. So the fact that this is equal to the logarithm of absolute value comes out of just some generalities on Chow groups. 
Okay. On the other hand, you expect this to be equal to that uh, uh, higher Green's function value at certain points. So what what is what one is saying is from the work of Mellet, you get that if you have a higher Chow cycle, you get some log algebra results. From the work of Gross and Zagier, they conjecture that if you have a relation, you get some log algebra. So therefore, it sort of makes sense that the two things are related. This is what we are uh, thinking. Mm. Okay. So explicitly, uh, oops, the off. Okay. The group <laughs> elements of uh, Chow K e to K minus. Okay, that should be two. Is present by formal sums. So in C i f i, where C i are coefficient k minus some varieties of e to k minus two, and if I have function of C i, so the divisor is zero. Relations come from the tame symbol. So uh, intersecting with the coefficient case cycle on Z on e to k minus two gives a collection of points x i j on Z intersection C i on e to k minus two, and the corresponding element of the group chow two k minus one e to k minus two one is product f i. Yeah, so you have a, if, for example, in our case, we have a, maybe a curve and some functions, and then you take the third guy, you get a certain points here, and these functions, the product of functions evaluated at those, those points is the element that one is interested in. Okay? And so, if the main point is that if all these things are defined over Q bar, then uh, if, the, if the cycles C, I, Z, and F, I are all defined over Q bar, then this thing has to lie in Q bar, and so therefore, it's a, so it's regulated as a log of an algebraic number in some natural way. Okay. So this Gross-Zagier conjecture is proved in many cases. Mellet proved it when one of the CM points is I, and there are no modulo from the weight for gamma of the expected weight. Marina Vyazovka proved it using Borchers lift in the case when there are two CM points, when the two CM points are the same discriminant, and uh, Yajin Zhu, Zhu proved it. In general, in the case when there are no modular forms, okay. So the statement that there are no modular forms translates to the fact that the CM cycle should be torsion. So it would imply that for each CM point, there's a higher Chow cycle with boundary precisely of that CM point and nowhere else. Okay, so that's a special condition which makes it a little easier, I suppose. Okay, so what happens in the case k equal to two? Okay, so what does it mean? Given a holomorphic modular form weight. Uh, a minus half f, we should be able to construct a higher Chow cycle, which we'll call xi f, with singularities at precisely the points determined by the principal part of f. Okay. Now one knows that for d greater than zero, uh, there are modular forms f d of weight minus half with principal part one over q to the d. Okay. These, you know, is, is the same thing which come up in the work of Funder here because uh, there are also weight minus half forms and. Uh, uh, yeah, um, more or less the same things. Okay, so you take the same forms which which are used there, and but you apply a different lift. Okay, so from the oops, from the above follows it means that there should be a higher Chow cycle, which has boundary precisely on those points where there's an element lambda in the neuron severity of square minus d, uh, because the the if you take the Lift of this guy, okay. It will have singularities on those points where there's an element uh, of those points on that orthogonal Shimura variety where there's a lambda in the uh, um, neuron semi lattice whose square is d. That's more or less. So you want to find a higher Chow cycle with those properties, okay. So what is so now? This is a general question. If you have an element in the neuron severity group. Well, if you know that your neuron severity group of your abelian surface is larger than one, then what is that extra element, right? So, like in the case of e cross e, you know that e cross zero, zero cross e, and the diagonal of the three guys. If it's, if it's e tau cross e tau, you know the fourth guy is the cm. But if I take an abelian surface with real multiplication, right, then you know that the neuron severity is rank two. But what does the extra cycle look like? You have no idea initially, at least. Okay, so. Having a cycle with square minus d basically translates to the abelian surface having uh, multiplication by q square of d. So this question was actually first, uh, you know, these are old questions and classical questions. So about 100, maybe more than 100 years ago, Humbe gave a beautiful characterization when d is equal to 5. So here is the following. So it turns out uh, to any abelian surface A, 
one can canonically associate a copy of P2 with six lines tangent to a conic. This is a classical construction of uh, maybe Kummer, I guess. Okay. The six lines will meet at 15 points. So, so, but of course, on P2, there are, there's only one element on the neuron severity. So you can't just take any cycle there and hope for that to give you your, your extra cycle by pulling back. Okay. Humbert showed that A has real multiplication by Q squared of 5 if and only if there's another conic passing through five of those 15 points and tangent to the sixth line. So you have some picture like this. You have a conic, and then you have uh, one, two, oops, sorry, three, four, five, this tangent, okay, and four, six. Oh no, you get another tangent line, so six. Okay, if you look at it, then they meet at 15 points, and uh, what his theorem is that you have to have another conic which passes through these five of these 15 points and is tangent to the sixth line. Okay, if you have that conic, then uh, your abelian surface will have real multiplication by q squared five. It's a really classical, you know, characterization of what that is. Okay, so this theorem was generalized to arbitrary d by Birken, Hake, and Willem about 10, 12 years ago. They showed that multiplication by Q squared over D was equivalent to the existence of a rational curve passing through a certain number of points and tangent to some lines uh, determined by D. Okay? So, um, right. Okay, so basically it's a kind of obvious, maybe the proof is not obvious, but the generalization is what you would expect. Instead of a conic, you have a rational curve and and maybe it's not necessarily non-singular, it can be singular, okay? So, in our case, what it means that given a multiplication of Q squared of D, uh, there's a distinguished rational curve on the associated P2. That's what it translates to, okay? Then you, so the situation is that maybe, uh, yeah, this is, you can, I'll talk about it on Monday in more detail, but you can pull that curve up to the associate. So, uh, there's a map from this abelian surface to this P2. I maybe didn't mention that, okay? And uh, you can pull that, and that's it. It's it's a it's a combination of two two to one maps. So in between you have this your your map from abelian surface to a to a to P3 and from P3 to P2, okay? And both the maps are two to one maps. So when you pull this curve up to the middle guy, uh, you get uh, two curves. So more or less, see if I if I if I have a curve, or this extra rational curve or conic or whatever on the P2 and I pull it back all the way to the abelian surface, I'm not going to get anything new because it'll just give you some multiple of the uh, polarization class. But, but I pull it in between and it turns out I have two curves. Okay? And if I pull one of them back, that gives you the extra cycle. Okay? But when you pull up to the, to the associated, uh, what do you call a Kuma K3 surface, you get a pair of conjugate rational curves. So, in some sense, you, you're dealing with Q square root of minus D. So, you can't really distinguish between minus square root of minus D and, or minus square root of D and, and plus square root of D. So, there should be two objects whenever you have, right? So, you get sort of conjugate things. And the sum is one ob is something in the rational numbers. So, that, that fact is sort of represented by the fact you have two conjugate rational curves whose sum is a class of something which is rational in some ways. Okay, then what happens is you can deform this this conjugate rational curve, this pair of conjugate rational curves. To so this is all in this place where you have multiplication by d. Okay, but in fact we want something with generic fiber, where there's no multiplication. By d. So it turns out you deform this to the generic fiber. Okay, using a old argument of Mo Mori and Mukai um, to the generic K3 surface, and then somehow you end up getting a nodal curve on a K3 surface. And a nodal curve on a K3 surface turns out to give you a higher Chow cycle in a very natural way. Okay, so and uh, so using that, you get this higher Chow cycle, which has precisely a boundary at where there is where it breaks up into two, and so on and so forth. So that will be uh, the details of this construction will be the subject of the next talk on Monday, I guess. Ah, okay, and uh, yeah, thank you.